Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Odd Man Front, a Sumer Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Parker Fleming, uh, and I'm here again on Thursday, continuing my series of interviews, discussions, conversations with smart people in and around the world of football and football analytics and numbers. Generally, we've had a, a great couple of guests the last couple of weeks, and I'm very excited to continue that today with a guy who is a friend of mine and someone I've talked uh, football and and life and numbers with uh, for, for a couple of years now. I'm really excited to have him on. I'll go ahead and pull him up. Uh, Matt Edwards, currently the head of... Um, Sorry, the music always loops. I'm so bad at that. It always just loops and throws me off. Matt Edwards is the head of football analysis at StatsBomb currently. Matt, uh, thanks for joining the show. How are you today? I'm great. I mean, that like I feel like that's some sort of like walk up music, pump up music. Like I'm I'm ready to go. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I remember I remember one time I did a radio hit and they asked me what they wanted my like song to be, and so I said "Welcome Home" by Coheed and Cambria, which is just this like just middle school rock, like very, oh, yeah. very loud thing. And I got on and didn't kind of know the hosts and there was just a quiet, kind of quiet space. And they're like, dude, what the heck was that? <laughs> <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so hopefully not that intense here, but um, yeah, man, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I, I thought it was funny today. I, I was just, you know, making sure I had your, your title and responsibilities at stats bomb, right. So we could talk about it. And I, I was surprised that you weren't, uh, you didn't have the designation of American football because for those uh, people who might not know, Stats Bomb kind of started across the pond, done a lot of work in soccer, but is rapidly expanding into uh, into North American sports. So I, I was surprised to see you not have that designation uh, between uh, between the, the real football and American football. Yeah, we I will say we have that internally, but externally it's just it, it makes sense to just say football because I don't really interact with anybody in the soccer space. So <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah. People can look at me and be like, "This guy, yeah, this guy's this guy's not doing soccer." So, yeah, um, yeah. Well, that, that that's uh, very excited to hear about your work there. I know I've gotten to see um, from you and from Ted some stuff you guys are working on, kind of behind the scenes. It's been just super impressive with tracking data, with working with teams and everything. And we'll get into a little of that here at the end. But mostly, just want to talk to you about you know the number one question I get, Matt. And I'm sure you get this a lot too. Is like how did you get into this? How did you get into sports analytics? What was your path? And I think your path is really interesting because you kind of have a foot on both sides of the, you know, coaching film and data analytics tree there. So, so you played in, in college. Um, tell me a little bit about that and kind of your experience as you know, a smart guy who was, who was traditionally football and started thinking analytically about the game. Yeah. So grew up, I, I loved the game of football. Um, luckily for me, my grandpa coached football he coached at BYU and so every Saturday we'd go down to the games and just being around um, you know as as much as we could I, I grew a like a huge love for the game of football especially college football like you know NFL is good and all but there's just something about the craziness and variability and just there's such difference in in so many things in college so uh, developed a, a huge love for the game of college football and was lucky enough to play. And um, I walked on at, at BYU and had an opportunity to play there for my four seasons. And um, when I was about halfway through college, decided that I just, I loved the game of football and I didn't want to do anything that was not around the game uh, because of my grandpa and kind of that path growing up. I thought that my way to stay in football was coaching and so um you know grew up loved football played football and, and started coaching and then that kind of started me in the the world of college sports and college football and um eventually led me on to you know being into the analytics side but um started definitely from a, a football side of things Yes, for I, I, you know, for 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 people who might not be familiar, your grandfather is Lavelle Edwards, one of the you know modern masterminds of of offense, and and uh, so a really rich lineage, and so certainly you've got the credibility and the background and and all of that on on the coaching side, you know, getting to interact with him and and uh, honestly getting a little bit of his brain and, and your brain too with the genes there. Um, so you you finish your your college career, and again, you're not you know you're not winning a Heisman Trophy, you're not considered for draft picks yeah. and you're thinking all right how do i continue and uh, look i'm i'm 510 i wasn't even you know i wasn't even walking on so i'm not saying anything uh -huh. there but uh uh you, you know you think okay i want to get involved in football and what a lot of guys do in that position is they go and they're like hey i'm going to be a ga you know somewhere and kind of grind up um and so you you kind of started on that path a little bit right yeah so i was a graduate assistant um you know my undergrad degree was in mathematics and 
when I was a graduate assistant, I was looking at different options for grad school. Um, one of the things I was looking at was actually a statistics master's, and then the other one was public administration. And at the time, I was like, you know, I want to get into coaching. There's a little bit more of the like people management kind of business type thing in public administration. So I ended up doing that. Um, but, you know, did a little bit of extra schooling as I was a graduate assistant. Um, which led me to an opportunity to get a full-time job coaching at a Division three school in Virginia and coached there for a couple of seasons and then ended up meeting um, back up with my college coach, Bronco, at the University of Virginia, um, where I became an analyst and then eventually the director of football analytics there. Um Awesome. I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think that's just, that's, that's really cool. of kind of a, uh, I'm going to have an open mind about like, how do I get to this path and, and what it looks like. Tell me about coaching at, at D3. I don't, I, I know, I don't know a ton about this. And a lot of people who listen to this podcast and, and the Sumer stuff are really more familiar with kind of the NFL. How, what, what are some of the big ways that you think um, coaching at D3 would be different even from, from coaching at, at D1 or a place like BYU? Yeah. When you're coaching at a division three level, there's, you know, you think of like the haves and have nots of power five and group of five um, at the division three level. It's, it's even more pronounced because there are teams that are really invested. Um, and then they're the teams that do really well. You know, Mount Union, Mary Harden Baylor, these teams that are, you know, have really good players and have really good investment from the university. And, and then there are some that are much less invested. And, and I went to I was coaching at one of those schools. And so. Throughout my time there, I was the recruiting coordinator. I coached offensive line. I coached receivers. I was the interim head coach for a little bit. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to do a little bit of everything. And so while I was there, I think I learned quite a bit about all the different types and of, um, you know, I had multiple coordinators and, and learned a bunch of different scheme schematics, but also learned a lot about um, just the game of football in general, because you, you have to do so much when you're at a level like that. Absolutely. And and I, I have to imagine, Matt, because one of your one of your skills and one thing I admire and how we've been talking is that you're you're really good at kind of communicating, all right, I know this this idea will work for the coaches, or I know that I can't bring this to a coach and get them to make anything actionable out of this, and, and kind of being able to decipher and communicate there. Having to play those multiple ro roles, kind of putting um multiple shoes on at, at that very, very applied level had to go a long way towards uh, you being able to kind of bridge this gap between data and decision making in the in the football space. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, one of the things that I learned, so I ended up while I was at the University of Virginia, um, I had the chance to do a master's of data science there. And in that class, they talked about the importance of having domain knowledge and how no matter what field you're in, having a really good understanding of that field can help guide you in your analysis. And so for me, the ability to think like an offensive line coach or think like a quarterback coach, even on the defensive side, to think like a, a linebacker coach really kind of opens up my mind to, to different ways to look at data and to, um, you know, what I can actually bring to a coach that would help them in their decision making, you know, throughout the week. How long were you at, at, at Virginia? You were director of football analytics there, matched back up with, with, with Bronco there for his tenure. How long, how long were you there? I was there for five seasons. Five seasons. Um, and, and what was your kind of described for, again, people who may not be familiar, what, what does a director of football analytics kind of do, uh, both in a big picture sense and a day-to-day -day sense uh, for, for a college program? Yeah, it's, it's, it was kind of a unique role. Um, there are becoming more and more people who are at least data friendly, let's say, at the college space. Um, but having somebody that's fully set apart to only do analytics was, was kind of unique. And so I really, you know, got to create the role um, that I had. You know, Bronco was open to data and was showing me a lot of trust in that position to kind of make it what it was. And so um, a lot of times I would just kind of be a problem solver for coaches. Um, they would come to me with, hey, we're trying to look for a new, you know, shot play or, hey, can you give us any information about blitzing in a specific area? And so I would be able to dive in the, into the data. Um, but really, you know, I would I would do a lot of research and exploration on my own, especially in the off season, um, you know. During the season, it's it's a little bit more of kind of your like like you're talking about the day to day where you're 
preparing reports and it's the kind of non-sexy side of, of data analytics where it's just a lot of time spent in front of the computer compiling reports and, and getting stuff ready for other people. Um, then in the off season was able to kind of do some bigger picture exploration projects, you know, what kind of data would I like to have, you know, maybe eventually tagging some of my own stuff to, to help build some bigger projects. Um, and so it was a pretty unique opportunity to kind of create what I thought that role should be because it was um, un uncommon really at that level. What were some of the initial hurdles uh, in kind of getting getting the program to uh, accept some of the analytical mindset thing, or maybe some was there, were, were there particular weird ideas that you kind of had to be strategic about? How do I communicate this in a way that a coach is going to you know treat treat this as a serious idea? Yeah, uh, I would say I was very lucky in that the staff that was there was the staff that I had worked with in a football sense before. They were. Mm -hmm. Uh, predominantly the staff that was at BYU that I was a graduate assistant for. And so I had quite a um, depth of trust from them in who I was and who my, and kind of my football mind. And so I took advantage of that in, um, you know, being able to bring things to them fairly early on and know that they would at least look at it. Um, there is always the aspect of, new things are difficult um, for anybody, really. It doesn't matter, just analytics. But if an idea is new or if a you know concept is new, it's it's difficult to, to get people to change or to see the benefit that can come from it. And so, um, you know, I'd say that's a, a big hurdle, no matter how well you know somebody is, if you're bringing something new to the table and, you know, trying to get them to implement something, it's a, it can be, problematic and, and troublesome. And especially in college football, where there is so much, you know, heterogeneity of style and there's so much weirdness that works. You look at Coastal Carolina's offense or, you know, something where you can just do something completely weird and really succeed in it. There is kind of the tension between, hey, let's try some things and try to maximize an edge. But also if you do something weird and you lose, that sticks out and the job security yeah. equation kind of becomes a little bit more tenuous there. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, the, one of the last seasons I was at UVA, we were doing some weird things. And, um, you know, we put some, one of our players, we didn't know exactly where he fit in a typical roster. And, and so we had the idea to roster him as a, a, quote, football player. And, you know, that people, some people thought it was weird. Some thought it was funny. But it's just one of those things that, you know, if, if you are going to be doing something a little bit different, it definitely sticks out and, and you put yourself out there a little bit for sure. Yeah, uh, and and love that. War number ninety nine was throwing passes, was moving him all over the field. How did that happen? Because if if I'm not mistaken, uh, he transferred in that the spring before that season. That was, um, oh my gosh, twenty one. He transferred in at twenty one. Yeah, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and so how did it kind of come about? Hey, like because he came in as a quarterback, I believe. And how did it look that he mm -hmm. was going to start, you know, moving around the field? Yeah, so. We're talking about Keaton Thompson. Thompson. I don't know if we said. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say. I don't know if we said Keaton Thompson's name out loud. But yes, uh, yeah, a, a player who came in and you guys kind of used interestingly yeah. uh, to 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 great success. I think. Yeah, so I love Keaton. He's a, a great kid, and and one of the things that we loved about him was his football knowledge. Um, he was a, a quarterback, high school quarterback, and then was recruited by Mississippi State to play quarterback um, as a dual threat athlete, kind of let him have the ball and, and make some magic. And then when they had a, a coaching changeover, he was looking for a new opportunity. And, and we brought him in at UVA truly to compete at quarterback. Um, he came in with a shoulder injury and you know wasn't able to really showcase his full ability at quarterback. But we knew that he had special athleticism and he knew that he wanted to just help out in any way that he could. And so his knowledge of playing quarterback, I think, helped him pick up other things quickly. So he could, we could show him a concept or an idea, and he would be able to go out there and run almost any one of those positions. You know, just show him, hey, this is our route concept. These are kind of our, our three-man thing that we're looking at. And he would go out and be able to run all three of them just because he, he understood things so well. Um, and so his kind of unique background of football knowledge and athleticism Kind of helped us explore and, and kind of go crazy with what we were doing with him.
Which is, um, yeah, that's 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 a lot of fun, and 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 again, good good uh, weirdness in in college football, and and cool to see that work there. When you were um, reporting and kind of doing those day to day things, I think that's a thing that a lot of people who are doing you know public analysis on Twitter and and, and trying to get into the, um, the the industry are really thinking a lot about what kinds of information were you presenting to coaches on a week to week basis, uh, kind of scouting for that next game and, and doing some self scouting. Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. And I think something that you asked earlier also ties in here in that, like when you asked about what is some, what are some hurdles that you get initially? And um, one of the things that I liked that I did, and, and I think is fairly common is that um, if you have new ideas or concepts, then you can put them into existing workflows so that it helps coaches. So, but basically one of the things that you do is you basically help prepare these reports for coaches um, throughout the week. Uh, you know, coaches spend a lot of time self-scouting. So each week helping the offense and defense see a report on how they are doing so far that season, you know, at post-game report, but then also kind of a full season report and then opponent analysis. And so, you know, Monday, Tuesday, even into Wednesday a little bit, you're helping to gather these reports. Um, I would sit in meetings with the offensive staff and I would help to answer any questions that came up that could be answered by data. So we'd be watching film and, and a coach would say, hey, I noticed this, they blitzed out of this certain package or when the offense was doing this, what's that, is that a, a high tendency or, or is that something that happens quite a bit? And so I'd be able there, I'd have my computer up with my data and, and be able to help quickly get that information and answer for them. And, and so it's a little bit of, you know, we have these weekly automated reports that you're getting ready, but then also being able to quickly dive in and help answer questions um, kind of in a, a more timely manner is uh, another aspect of that. And I imagine that also goes hand in hand with you kind of already had the repertoire and the trust, but being able to on the fly answer those questions only builds up that cachet of, hey, I've got this knowledge, I can help you with this, I can offer solutions, which then leads into more of being able to say, hey, here's, a, here's an idea I had, let's, let's actually talk about it and seriously, uh, seriously consider it there. Yeah, totally. You, you, like you're saying, it, it builds trust. And then when they see that you're able to come up with an answer or, or something that helps them fairly quickly, then they um, start coming back to you with other thoughts or other questions. And then, um, you know, you continue to build that and then you're able to start suggesting things or, um, hey, you know, we're doing this, maybe we could try something else or, you know, whatever it is. But, you know, as you continue to build that trust, then, then you have a little bit more um, of a leg to stand on as you're out there suggesting new ideas. Makes a lot of sense. I'm totally putting you on the spot here, but uh, before we kind of sun down on, on talking about Virginia and talk and get into what you're working on now, uh, do you have a favorite memory of a favorite game maybe that stands out at Virginia, a time where, you know, you guys did something great or, or just that, that that stands out to you in your time uh, in your five years there? Yeah. I mean, there are so many. Um, that's the, that's this one thing that I miss about being with working with a team is kind of the game day atmosphere and, going to see new stadiums and, you know, the pageantry and, and everything of college football. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing like being on a headset and listening to, to everything as, as crazy stuff's going on. But um, I'd say probably the biggest memory is when we beat Virginia Tech to win the ACC Coastal, kind of clinch a chance to go to the um, ACC Championship, which meant we were, you know, going to the Orange Bowl, win or lose, basically. And, it had been, you know, 14 or 15 years to of losing to them and to do it at home in front of a, a crowd. I mean, I was up in the box and I like tackled one of our defensive coaches and you know, it was awesome. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I imagine in addition to missing the pageantry and also missing the tangible, hey, this week we did good because we won or, or we didn't do good because we lost uh, kind of situation. You're probably in uh, you're probably missing out on a little bit of swag. I'm imagining you got a lot less new team gear on a kind of a weekly basis at StatsBomb relative to working for a D1 program. Uh, yes, I, I'm. My wife works at Nike, and so we have some nice discounts there. But I, it's been a year and a half, and I still haven't bought new running shoes because I'm just, you know, running through a, a bunch of old uh, issued shoes, and so um, definitely miss that aspect for sure. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, so you're at, you're at Virginia and coach Mendenhall decides to hang it up after I, I, I think I'll say illustrious career, 135 and 80, 81 record, 14 bowls, two Mountain West conference championships and a Mountain West conference coach of the year in, uh, in 2006, great career. He decides to hang it up and you are moving on. How did you get connected with stats bomb? And then tell me kind of what they, what they brought you on to do. And then we'll talk a little bit about some work that you're doing now. Yeah. So, um, you know, Bronco resigned. It was pretty unexpected and, and we didn't know exactly what was happening. Um, a friend of, of both of ours, Bill Conley, had reached out to me and just said, hey, how's it going? You know, are you going to get a chance to stay there? Just kind of checking up on me. And, and I said, yeah, I think so. I don't know. You know, I guess we'll see who the new coach is. And, and he had said, you know, if this happens or not, like some of my friends uh, who are working at StatsBomb are starting this new product and I think it's pretty neat. Would you be interested in meeting with them? I was like, oh yeah, sure. Um, not really thinking much of it. And so Bill set up this meeting between me, Ted Knudsen, who's the CEO at StatsBomb and, and Seth Partner, who's our director of North American Sports. Um, and, you know, they showed me the product and, and I thought it was pretty interesting. And at, at the time, it was not a, hey, we're interested in hiring you. It was just, here's our product. What do you think? Let's get some feedback. Uh, but they were looking for somebody in, in a position that, you know, as they explained it, knows football and, and knows the data side as well. And they just said, if you know of anybody, not like, would you be interested? But if you know of anybody, let us know. So I went home, I talked to my wife. And I was like, hey, I had this pretty cool meeting. And, and she was like, well, you are you interested? Like you could be that somebody. And then it's like, well, I, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I have a job at Virginia or, or what the future holds. So um, I guess I should at least look into it. And um, so went back to Ted and was like, Hey, I, I, if I could be that person, if you're interested and, and they were like, Oh yeah. Um, you know, we, I think you'd be great. Um, they offered me a, a job right then. And, and I said, can I, get some time. Like, I don't know what's going to happen at UVA. I don't know what's happening. Like, can I have a little bit of time to decide? And so they gave me some time and, and which was nice. I got to kind of explore a couple of different options. Um, and at the end of the day, had a, a couple of different offers and, and ended up taking the job at StatsBomb. Cool. Cool. And so, yeah, so StatsBomb, again, works on uh, in the past has worked on soccer, uh, specifically a lot of work with the uh, transfers in, in soccer and a lot of work with tracking data, expected goals, all sorts of visualizations. Really, really cool. Um, as they're expanding into, into college football, and again, Matt, I'm just going to say this, you know this, anytime we hit a fence, tell me and we can pull back and don't have to give away state secrets about anything you guys are working on. Want to celebrate and talk about the cool stuff, but uh -huh. let me know, you know, but yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you guys are, you guys are working on a little tracking data. You're working with some programs and, and trying to really ramp up the prevalence of uh, player level kind of tracking data at the college, at the college level. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so for our product, we have what you're basically saying. We have event-based tracking data as well as frame by frame tracking data. Um, we are releasing free data regularly. And so it's not you know, a state secret to at least talk about the data. Uh, so what we have is, is we, and this is all available on, um, we have the GitHub, we have a Twitter account that's tweeting about it, but basically we are profiling Tom Brady's career um, from beginning to end. And so we've released two seasons worth of play-by-play -play and event level data. And so this is event tracking where you get kind of every, the location of all the players at a bunch of different events throughout the play. Usually it's about 55 or you know, 60, depending on the play. Um, but then we are also releasing at the end of the month a frame by frame, kind of 30 frames per second tracking data of Tom Brady's entire, I think it's at least one season, probably his last two seasons. So everyone will be able to take a look at this, you know, free data set of, you know, publicly available tracking data at the NFL level. Um, what we are doing is we are collecting this data from video and then we are turning it around to give data to teams and media entities and sports agencies, as well as um, we have built a couple of, like you mentioned, really nice looking and thought out um, visualization tools for um, these people to um, help them dive into the data. Because often at the college level, like I was talking about earlier, they don't have the 
support or infrastructure to handle full tracking data. Um, and so we've done uh, a few things to help them internalize and ingest some of the things uh, at a deeper level. Cool. Yeah. And that's, and that's something that really doesn't exist. You know, there's, there's, there's products out there that have, you know, charted data and, and some, you know, yards for contact and, and that kind of stuff. But the tracking data really also go, kind of contributes to um, that. It gets me excited. You said something earlier, kind of, uh, I know in my experience talking to coaches, a lot of them are like, yes, I want data. What, what can you show me? Like I, I initially, when I talked to coaches was saying like, Hey, what do you want to see? And they kind of flip that question on me. They're like, well, what can you give me that gives me an edge? And and tracking data really, really opens that up because then you can start to answer a lot of questions and um, move move kind of in whatever direction the uh, the that, that you see in the data. Um, well, while you've been doing that, you've been posting a, a pretty cool series, I, I guess series, uh, just collection of articles over there at Stats Bomb, just talking through some of the some of the things you're doing, looking at some interesting questions. Um, you've got stuff on the transfer portal specifically that I thought was really interesting. Um, what have you been looking into about the transfer portal and uh, and kind of how that's changing the game here in 2023 for college football? Yeah, like you mentioned on the soccer side, our product. I mean, helps teams at the Premier League level at, you know, kind of the the main, I think it's called the top five leagues across the country. You know, we have uh, some uh, heavy hitting um, soccer teams that are spending millions of pounds and euros and, and whatever their currency is um, in transfer market deals based on the data that they're getting from StatsBomb. And the way that the transfer market works in soccer it's been around for a long time, whereas the transfer portal on the football side is is relatively new, right? And so what something that we have seen is that um, college football teams are really kind of reactionary when it comes to the transfer portal, where it's, oh, this player's in the portal, let's see what we can find out about them. And on the soccer side, it's they spend all year round kind of diving into the data and diving into who who are they interested in targeting? What does that look like? And it, it should be similar on the, on the football side, on the college football side is you, if you want to compete in the transfer portal, you have to be ready to move with actionable information fast. Um, these people enter the portal and, and they're making college decisions within a day or two. Sometimes there's some, you know, let's just say collusion and um, I can't remember, tampering is what the NBA term for it is. Uh, but oftentimes they're just, I'm done here. I know I want a new place. Let's go. Let's, I'm going to open up, see who's interested and then make a decision. And so, you know, we have uh, some really cool tools that we've built for transfer portal recruiting to help give these staffs a chance to make some really good decisions in a quick manner. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we regularly will put out examples of our player radars. Um, you know, we have radars built for every position that kind of tracks 10 to 14 of the most important and most stable metrics year over year to help these people get a, a good look at, hey, here's a, a one single view of what a player does. Now, take that and, and go run with it in the rest of your analysis that you're doing. Yeah, which is cool. And, and I think it's a really interesting problem, especially because a lot of the value can be had from the lower leagues to the higher to the to, to you know, the power five there and, and guys transferring up. Um, but there's such interesting potential for fit to matter. You think about Keon Coleman and uh, transferring from Michigan State and Big Ten East power five and uh, and transfers to Florida State is absolutely taking off because the gravity of that offense is, is fundamentally changed. Or Luther Luther Burden at Missouri, I think, is another guy that kind of the inverse is happening. Uh, last year, they really couldn't get the ball to him very much consistently. They brought in Theo Weiss, really stretches out the offense, really gives him the opportunity there. And so the problem is interesting because it's not only who are the outliers, but how will that fit kind of translate to um, to the these higher levels? Um, I, I have a, I have a theory. This is just hairbrained. And now, Matt, we're just talking ball here. So I'm putting oh, it on the spot again. It. 
I think that there are some positions you can get in the transfer portal and there's some that, that don't translate as well. And I'm actually not sure which side of the line quarterback falls on now. Uh, Cause I think we're seeing a lot of these transfer quarterbacks have extremely mixed returns. I know you've looked at how, how they've done against their, um, their opponents is, is, is the transfer market for quarterbacks. Is that just much harder to solve? Is it, we're just seeing a couple bad, bad beats here with guys not, not panning out or, or is there something else going on here in your opinion? Um, I would say if you ask anybody in football, but especially in the NFL, the analysis, evaluation, and projection of quarterbacks is, is the hardest position to do it in. And so I think we're starting to see that at the college level as well. Um, you know, somebody like Caleb Williams, who transfers from Oklahoma with his coach to USC, that's obvious. He's still going to be successful. He's an incredible player. But you look at examples like Jeff Sims transferring from Georgia Tech to Nebraska. He's someone that, you know, new, new scheme, new coaches, new scenario. What's that going to look like? It's it's hard to do. Um, I, I remember I read this book. It was a, like quarterback play. It was by um, Brian Billick. And it was, you know, 250 pages. And he talked about all the different things he would do when he would analyze quarterbacks. And then the last chapter was like, basically, we don't know. It's like, it's it's a toss up. Like you spend more money, more time evaluating that position because of the importance of the position. And you're still, it's, it's still a toss up almost, almost all the time. So it's it's such a hard position and, and really, um, you know, you, you do your best with what you can, but it's it's tough for sure. Yeah, and, and uh, it's funny, we had uh, Cade Massey on earlier this summer, and he was talking about just how basically in the draft, at every position, but especially at quarterback, kind of like QB1 versus QB2 is basically a coin flip as to whether it's going to work out. And so there's really, it's really hard to trade up and make, you know, make a decisive decision there just because there's so much kind of not that, that happens there. And empirically really interesting because, yeah, you're right, you have to control, can I control for scheme? Can I control for the individual? How do I, how do I move there? And, um, and obviously the development matters. We're seeing some guys transfer super early and maybe not, not getting to the right spot. Some guys transferring a little bit too late and kind of already have, have missed the window on their development there. So really, really interesting and, uh, uh, problem. And, um, yeah, I think things like things like tracking data can help you kind of get some of those underlying metrics and, and not just those counting stats to, to kind of understand what do I like about this guy and how might he fit. Um, along those lines and kind of adjacent to to transfer portal, I, I have to bring this up because I think this is hilarious. And that is my favorite thing about a metric. Like I'm only going to like a metric if it is funny. And I like this Randy metric that you've been writing <laughs> about a little bit. Great name, named after Randy Moss. It's a wide receiver metric, uh, something you're playing around with. What is it? What does this Randy metric do? Yeah, so I, uh, first off, I think it's funny that you brought up the name because I was like, it has to be named after Randy Moss. And then <laughs> so many people were like, don't name it after anybody. That's so dumb. And I was like, it'll at least stick. It'll it'll sit in somebody's mind. So glad to hear it worked on you or my little trick. Uh, but it was one of those things like I was unfamiliar with tracking data in general when I took this new job at StatsBomb. And so I started with a fairly what I thought was basic look at okay the ball is thrown at a certain point i know the location of where everybody is at that point and then when the ball is caught i know the location of everybody at that point um randy moss is you know kind of probably the premier deep threat player in nfl history someone that you would just throw the ball up to and, and no matter where he was he would be able to run under it and get it or jump over you know three defenders and go get it uh, but the idea behind Randy is basically tracking the distance that a player runs while the ball is in the air. And so if you, and then using that for different types of analysis. So if you're running like a 10 yard curl, you are based in, in theory, you you would have a zero Randy, you get to 10 yards, right. you turn around, you wait <clears> for the ball. If you're running like a, a 10 yard out and the quarterback is, you know, you're on the left hash and you're on the, your right slot, you're running a 10 yard out, catching it on the boundary. You're probably running 10 ish yards, let's say before the ball gets to you and you catch it while the ball's in the air, depending on, you know, if you have Caleb Williams, it's probably not 10 yards, um, but you're, you're, you're running while the ball is in the air. And so what I thought was, how can we use this to 
One, look at how well people are able to trap the ball and run under the ball and, and go make a play. But then also, how are they being utilized in scheme, right? You know, when you talked a little bit earlier about scheme fit, you know, a five yard out a, you know, bubble, what, what are you doing when you're running these routes? So average depth of target tells you something, but using Randy can tell you a little bit more as well. And, and how much they're actually moving. Do they track the ball? Well, um, you know, something that we collect at Stats Bomb is the location of the ball at the time of catch attempt, like in relation to the receiver. So not just catchable, uncatchable, but the actual location. So being able to tie a bunch of these metrics in, you can kind of develop a, a cool way to look at receiving metrics. Um, you know, you mentioned Keon Coleman. Um, you know, one of the things that we noticed at Michigan State for him was his, you know, incredibly high contested catch rate. And, you know, it, it's something that has transferred over with him to, to Florida State to see his ability to, you know, he's a, a basketball player to kind of go rebound the ball, go up and, and snag it away from other people. Um, and so that kind of stuff, like, it, and I'm now just rambling about how cool data is and its translation yeah. to football, which I love, but, um, you know, it's kind of a, a long answer to what you're asking. No, that's, uh, that's great. And that's, man, that's my, that's my wheelhouse right there. I love that. And I think that's, I think that's so cool. You mentioned, uh, look, looking at our time here and we'll, we'll wind down. I don't want to keep you too long, but I did want to ask one more, uh, just off that you mentioned kind of the contestable target uh, ability of, of Keon Coleman and how that, that translated forward. Are there a couple other metrics that you, you found? Hey, the, you know, um, again, don't give away the secret sauce. I know what you guys are working on. That's totally fine. But for college players that are, that are interesting in the sense of, Hey, this might be a little bit of a signal of to this player's quality, or this might be a little bit of, of luck. Um, trying to think of, of the best way to, to answer this question. Uh, so one of the things, like I mentioned, so we do have eat a radar for every position and, and we have done studies and, and, you know, lots of research into what of these metrics are going to translate year over year and put all of these into our radars for teams. Um, it, one of the difficult things in dealing with that is, is trying to normalize for scheme differences, um, you know, differences in strength of schedule and opponent and what that will look like moving from one division to another division. And so it's a, a challenging question that really deserves a lot of um, spot out process of, of what you're trying to do and, and what you're going to look at there. Um, you know, I really like a couple of things. We've built a couple of metrics that I really like. Um, and they involve quite a bit of the tracking data. You know, we built a Completion percentage over expected model, which I think is fairly normal, um, but we also built a catch um, rate over expected model, which takes into account, again, where the ball location is at the time of catch attempt, as well as the location of defenders and when the ball was thrown and how much they ran, et cetera. And so the more things that you can put into a metric that makes sense and um, are you know unique factors that will give you more information about it and make your um, end value you know more reliable the better right if you can you, know, you obviously want to make it as simple as possible with as robust as possible and so there's this tricky balance there as well but um, it it requires a lot of thought for sure in, in what you're doing and all underscored by you know small sample size and yeah. Uh, these kids are 18 to 22 and a lot can change in an off season for some of them. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky problem. Well, Matt, just uh, lo love the stuff you guys are doing at stats bomb, uh, you know, enjoy chatting with you. And um, when Ted sends me a graph in my DMS, it just makes my, it just makes my day to see some <laughs> stuff you guys are working on. So um, where can people uh, follow you and kind of, kind of follow along with what stats bomb doing the articles you're writing and, and all of that. Uh, yeah. So my Twitter account is at the coach Edwards, um, which, as you had mentioned, my grandpa is really the coach Edwards. I'm just like this, you know, minor figure in a footnote. You're a, co you're a coach Edwards. <laughs> I might have to change it to just a, a coach Edwards. Uh, but at the coach Edwards and then our stats bomb account that tweets out a bunch of things um, is stats bomb underscore FB for football. Um, you know, put out an article today about some of our offensive linemen, um, movement using tracking data so where the offensive line moves from their initial snap to their first engagement point 
Um, it's you can get some really cool analysis when you're starting to look into stuff like that. Um, you know, just some of the things that it, are there in, in our data, which is um, pretty unique that we we're really excited about. Cool, cool. Well, we'll, we'll direct people there. Matt, thanks so much for, for joining the show today. Uh, everyone listening, this has been Odd Man Front, a Sumer Sports podcast. Make sure you check out the channel. A lot of good content over there. Like it, all that good stuff. And uh, I'll see you next week with a with another, uh, hopefully another interesting and, and fun interview. 